Hi, my name is Betty Shamia, and I am the Mellon Playwright in Residence at the Classical Theater of Harlem. Welcome to the Chronicles of Fortitude series. Our first guest is Marco Jefferson, the Pulitzer Prize winning critic and author of Negroland, a New York Times bestseller. Thank you for joining us. It is such a pleasure and an honor to speak with you. I just am overwhelmed with gratitude that you're willing to do this at this time, because I really feel that this series is gonna help other artists, including me, talk to people uh, about fortitude in a time where uh, there's so much uncertainty. So I would just love for us to just have a freewheeling conversation about times where you felt that you faced things that were like a personal pandemic <laughs> in some way, in which you were able to, uh, use or galvanize or lean upon uh, certain either inner resources or other people um, that kind of helped you create the kind of work that I think is so important in our culture. And I just want to thank you for the impact that your work had on me personally and so many artists. And I think in, in my opinion, I've never read something like Negro Land, which really encapsulated a whole cultural memoir of a community, as well as your own very personal story. So I'd love to just talk about what led you to uh, the very exciting uh, career that you've had that has spanned so many different genres. Well, only two genres, actually. <laughs> criticism and memoir. Um, within criticism, right. it's true. Um, I, I was always kind of avid to be able to write about, you know, not just books, but also maybe music or dance and fashion or movies. It, it's, it was that the way all the arts um, inflected and collaborated with each other and also the way the, they, they take different positions and take on different meanings in the culture and in all these, you know, cultural spaces that are also political spaces and, and spiritual spaces and gendered and racial spaces that we inhabit. So, right. you know, finding l language for all of that has been, has been jip difficult. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I, um, I, I w was very interested in the connection between your solo work and what became Negro Land. Um, now that's, that's, yeah. Uh, uh, I think the solo work, you mean the solo theater work? Yeah. yeah. It made it, actually, I think it was my first step towards Negro Land because, you know, when you're a critic, uh, the fact is you, you are inside this, somewhat well-protected persona, right? You know, you're, it's understood that you're, you're there with some authority, um, you're making judgments, that's always a form of protection. You know, even if you're asking questions, um, you know, you've, it's, it's, it's a kind of cultural branding, being a, being a critic, you know, you, um, doing a solo theater piece, first of all, it meant I had to write differently. I had to write, it was a, I had to write monologues, you know, I, I had to get at um, emotions and, and, and contradictions and, and really just keep them out there. Um, mm -hmm. I had to be kind of aggressively vulnerable mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, and, uh, yeah um, full of ambivalences, all of which you, you navigate very differently when you're a critic. And I had to stand up there alone, um, you know, and I, I couldn't, yes, it was, I was a persona, yes, it was a character, but you know, obviously it was an autobiographical work. So there was, there was nothing to tuck myself um, inside of as protection. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I probably could have written Negro Land without that transition. Some of the material um, that is in Negro Land, you know, really started in that solo piece. And yes, wow. in a rougher form because I was just 
It was my first experience with writing anything um, theatrical. And it was my first experience really writing that kind of, of kind of raw autobiographical material. So yeah, it, it, it needed to get reshaped, but it first showed up there. It really did. That's incredible. And you, you talk a little bit about your experience of your mother watching that show and, and how, how, how emotional that was for her. Oh um, my God, <laughs> yes. You know, um, I mean, my mother, and that's so in, in the book, is this kind of um, avatar of um, elegance and control and, and mm -hmm. wit. Um, even when she's being very somber and serious, it's always shaped in some way. Right, and um, it had been my, my, the role I had cast myself in and been cast in, in my family, you know what I mean, you, you mm -hmm. both adopt the role and it's imposed on you, was, um, you know, the more, the more seemingly obliging daughter um, and the one who rather than confronting her parents with something really challenging was going to find a way to do it without necessarily having to confront them so <laughs> you so know kind of a, the opposite of a solo show almost <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right so you know, there was mother um there was mother who'd come to new york to see this show with her daughter mm -hmm. who was at the new york times right <laughs> here were these monologues about wanting to kill myself and put my head in the oven and you know even some of the stuff that she'd lived through with me like you know in the, in the, the black power in the 60s mm -hmm. when we were like who do you think you are you corrupt bourgeois people you know, for it all to come um back you know at her on a stage was um was something she she was she was very impressive she by which I mean she could have acted out and punished me. And mm -hmm. she really, she, had, she had admired it. Um, wow. She was proud of me. And when my director said to her, well, how did it feel? She said, well, it was, she said parts were really painful. She said, that's, you know, it's hard to see a child going through that. But it was not said punitively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was good. Now. Always with a memoir, your fortitude is required <laughs> to combat, you know, your your fears um, about what your family and the people in that world. Because you're right, it was a collective in certain ways portrayal. Mm -hmm. So you know what what they're going to think, how they're going to approve, how they're going to disapprove. Despite you know that lovely story I just told you about my mother watching me on stage. Um, right. You know, I knew when I was writing the book that um, I had to be careful with what I told her about what I was doing. My father had died by then, which is why I'm really focusing on my mother. And I think mm -hmm. every writer, um, you really have to protect yourself when you're dealing with that kind of charged material. You're also thinking all the time about right. the relationship between, and it's very tricky, are you protecting your family and there's some things you are protecting i mean but are you censoring things that need to be said um because your protection is really a form of fear um or a way for you as a writer not to face up to material you need to you know you can be doing that and I'll always say well you know it's really because i'm i'm protecting <laughs> i'm being thoughtful of my mother no maybe you're just being cowardly right <laughs> you know? yeah, so, absolutely yeah and, and 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 still be shaping the material in some way and be cognizant that you are yeah. while you're you're doing that dance it's um it's quite the dance yeah and you know one of there's something about you know being performative in the way that uh the performance of elegance which I think was what was so striking to me about what I um, what I kind of gleaned from not just the memoir but the the solo piece that I read because I didn't have the wonderful chance to see you perform, but the idea of being but you did meet you know, my other ones, and which was such an honor and a pleasure <laughs> and. <laughs> 
and I still, uh, my shoes were slightly scuffed and I felt that I should not have walked in with scuffed shoes. <laughs> They were scared, but they were scuffed. Oh, that's scuffed. <laughs> that's right. That's such a parental move, too. I love you know, it. It's such, you know, it's funny, you know, do they, are you, should you wear cheap, unscuffed shoes or expensive? <laughs> you know, that's the dance of life, I guess. I um, <laughs> but she, she was such a force of being. And I think that there's something wonderful about that kind of elegance. In a, in a person and in a performance and, and in a way of being in the world that um, I think is lost on somebody who does not have that kind of nat you know, like natural, I don't know, uh, you know, there's a French saying that, you know, w w but your mother really had it. And, and I felt that that came through in uh, the book as well, that kind of sense of a real characterization of what she, uh, was like so that was really wonderful I'm, I'm, now and not now, only lovable which is yes too yeah absolutely but such oh. wit wit oh, you know <laughs> you know it, she was aesthetically fascinating to me and that is uh -huh. a kind of gift if you can absolutely get that absolutely in a parent yeah, yeah. absolutely um and and it's kind of the last thing to go that kind of elegance you know what i mean in terms of uh of as we age, you know, it's, it's, you know, as we're in this pandemic, we're grooming the idea of being elegant for oneself and performing it for oneself. I'm thinking a lot more about those kinds of things. And what do you do for yourself when no one's seeing you? You know, right. like, no, that's absolutely and, right. and you get the sense that someone of your mother Irma's ilk would have still been looking good you know like somehow in the pandemic you know like been bringing it to the table um yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, even in her very late years you know absolutely all those little and it's funny we do um those of us who are lucky enough to have our shelter um you know we we are working with what rituals and habits are are just have to be done and what ones we we need we choose and often there's this kind of tension between the ones you know the things you just have to do the various protective this is and that's and the mm -hmm. and even the things you have to take in and think through and and the ways in which you can relieve yourself give yourself pleasure and also the little pleasures and 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 indulgences and rituals help give you the fortitude you know, to, to face the others. <sighs> Don't you find that you wake up every morning, particularly the first weeks, um, I would wake up and I would think, oh, you know, something of the day that, and then I would think, oh no, we're, we're in the pandemic. <laughs> you know, they, and I don't mean I'd suddenly collapse, but it was just that reality had altered. You know, it was another, another condition another state of being well for me it's like you know every self-help book says you know write things you're grateful for and for me i felt like that was like writing a list of things that would be blighted and taken from you you know as you, as, you know it's very hard to be thankful for one's health or one's livelihood or one's family when when so many people are losing those very things it almost true. seems like a jealous god is snatching these things away from people so what so does I, gratitude mean exactly it can feel self <laughs> is what you're saying yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. or it feels like you're, you're like making a list of something that someone's gonna come and like cross and, sna and snatch <laughs> okay if that's what you're grateful for give it here <laughs> because so many people are losing those very things around you uh at, at an alarming rate so to me the only way that i could really you know kind of metabolize this experience is be like what other times have i felt this frightened and and how did I deal with it? So I wrote. So now I'm writing lists of things where I I sh maybe I shouldn't have been able to overcome that. You know, how did I get that? How was I able to live through that, or or, or be a person who was still functional, at you know at whatever high level or low level that I was in in my various roles in life. Um, so I wanted to ask you about your men mentors. I wanted to ask you about your mentors. If there was somebody. Or, or a few people, or a type of person, you don't really have to necessarily name people, where, where they said the right thing, like, oh, I really think this should be a book, 
or, oh, I really feel, you know, you're ready to do this. Or even, you know, I did this at this stage and, and you gleaned from it, but maybe I can too. Uh, you know, it's funny. I have, not so funny. I have worked with some very, very good editors, but I did not go. I went to journalism school and I had a couple of terrific teachers who were very appreciative and supportive, but that was gone within a year. So, you know, that yeah, helped yeah. me start. Um, edit, red relations with editors are, are often a little charged, you know, because they represent the language of the institution and the, right. the, the rules of that um, as much as, at least as much as they um, are, are representing in a sense, your best version of yourself on the page. Um, I was also um, um, a touchy, defensive in certain ways writer. And um, I think that had something to do with my being um, in many cases, the first black or the first woman, you know, at a, at a big, at a big institution or in not at a big institution. I was never the first black or the first woman, but in a certain position, mm -hmm. you know, I was the first mm -hmm. black woman book reviewer, um, you mm -hmm. know, critic at Newsweek. Um, mm -hmm. I was not the first black, but I was the first black woman to be a critic mm -hmm. at the time. So, you know, there is a certain, um, you're, you're being proprietary about your own, <laughs> about yourself. Um, and uh, I think that sometimes made me a little un, self-protectively self defensive. You need your defensive. So that's why I'm mm -hmm. adding self-protectively. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I tended to keep, um, older writers um, in journalism at a distance. Um, what I have found, um, and this doesn't, maybe the word mentor doesn't fully apply, maybe it's um, comrades, collaborators. Um, what I have found is, is over the years, um, a small group cluster of um, dear, dear friends, all writers, who wow. they read my work, I read theirs and, you know, there's, there's trust and there's rigor there. Wow. Um, and wow. so maybe what I, I needed was that sense of we start on an equal footing, but we uh -huh. each have um, gifts, skills that That's the incredible. other needs, you know? Wow. That's incredible. So that incredible. has been, that has been um, terrific. Um, That's kind of kind of blowing my mind because I, I, you know, when I was shaping this series and what to ask and talk about, you know, uh, the idea of touchiness, and and you need people to be on equal footing with you because whenever there's a, you know, a power dynamic in any way, you know, whether it's an editor who could promote your book a little harder at a you know, place that <laughs> bought the book, you know what I mean? Or like yeah, yeah, yeah. a theater company who, in my case, might produce my next play, you right. know, uh, it, it, you're, you're doing a, a business dance in addition to an artistic dance. But when you have an actual tribe of people, a family that you choose, um, that, that brings a lot of, uh, for lack of a better word, fortitude for you know it brings it gives oh. you kind of you know what you need to get through um and I think also the importance of being able to laugh you know at yourself with your friends mm -hmm. uh, at, at, at people who may not get you or or no that's or to your work and yeah. look stupid you know <laughs> oh boy did it that was that written badly you know the idea <laughs> in my years as a journalist that I might mm -hmm. turn in something to an editor, um, you know, and that it really wouldn't look good, that they would think, oh, that was silly. This was not <laughs> bearable. This was not endurable to me, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah. Th there is, there is that, that trust element that means, okay, I, I, prat I that was a pratfall. <laughs> okay, it doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> I'll go back. I'll fix it. <laughs> There's an actor. No, also when you were, I mean, I did, I did um, deadline journalism for many years. It is also mm -hmm. true 
that when you're working on a book, you know, there is the fortitude to get through it. I think, I think Edith <laughs> Wharton said there's a certain sex section of a novel, but I just expend it to a book. It doesn't have to be a novel. It's like being in the Gobi Desert. And that's <laughs> true. But you also, <laughs> you have the protection of your, you know, of, of privacy. Then yeah. it goes, then you're sharing it with the people you trust. And, right. you know, then you're sharing it with the book editor who is the book. A book editor is, is there as the two of you work out. You know, it's not the same thing as, as deadline journalism. So mm -hmm. that gives you both a lot more. That gives you more room. And that also wow. again, sets up more, more um, collaborative equality. And, it, you know, something you, you mentioned, the idea of the gift of time, you know, in one case, you, need, you don't have the time, so you might, I almost feel like in terms of me, I would, might generate more if I had like, yes. you know, our, I might get out deadlines. of that desert quicker, you know, like no, if I, I, know, I you had know, deadline. Yeah. I know what you mean. I, I, even as, after I said this, I thought, like, yeah, but that, all those deadlines, taught me things. And I have also gone through periods, like when I left, basically left regular journalism and started teaching, where I just wasn't writing enough. You know, mm -hmm. I just slid back and, and went into some overly, this has got to be perfect if it's going to go in. <laughs> right, you know? right, yeah. Um, or, well, I, I need lots and lots of time. I, I, so it's a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky balance. You do need a sense of, of free, imaginative, and thinking space that we do need. That's interesting. And now we have it, and we have it in spades. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, we do, but it's also very tricky because our minds and hearts and spirit are jammed full of all yeah. the contradictions complications horrors of this pandemic oh uh, it's so i you know i don't mean we don't also have that other but we we are we're packed well i don't think any of us know how to process we can't what's happening to us and also we're unlike you know the flu pandemic i feel like we've all been left to these devices that we're addicted to you know, like, like we, we're, we're just here with our devices, you know, and, uh, but these are the same sort of screens and, and things. And I just, you know, I, when I got out of school, there was no internet, you know, there was no streaming, there was no, you know, and I just could not imagine, I mean, we couldn't be talking, we would be talking on the phone, but I don't think we would have a way to stream this conversation in a way, you know, uh, um, and, and, but it's interesting. So it, it, it's, it's a blessing and a curse because now we, we don't just have CNN, we have, you know, Facebook updates and, um, and the news coming out in New York is so terrible. You know? And text messages all the time. Yeah. From <laughs> exactly. political organizations, from, <laughs> yeah, exactly. from news, the, yeah. Right. And so we're so alone, but we're over inundated with, you know, absolutely. absolutely. Other people's energies and it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're all forced together in some way. And, all, and that also means all the things we can't be sure of and don't know. Uh, our sense of that is multiplied too. Right, right. Well, Margot, I'm just, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I am so grateful to you. Um, thank you for being part of our programming. Oh, and I'm proud to be. And, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I'm going to watch we, it on. <laughs> Hello, this is Andre Brower. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of attending several productions produced by the Classical Theater of Harlem. The magic of theater has always been its power to change the way we look at ourselves and connect to the world around us. I and my family are so inspired by the Classical Theater of Harlem's mission that I've proudly become a trustee of the organization. Classical Theater of Harlem's work in Upper Manhattan utilizes public and private spaces to bring culture, commerce, and vibrancy to the uptown community. Their approach to telling these complex, rich stories enables us to recognize that our similarities are far more compelling than our differences. We value the impact it has on the community 
and I'm committed to see it thrive and expand in the years to come. In celebration of CTH's 20th anniversary, we humbly ask to be part of your giving plans this season. We are launching our $20 for 2020 campaign, where we are asking supporters to make a recurring donation of $20 per month for the upcoming 2020 season. Your contribution supports emerging artists, empowers young designers, choreographers, and administrators, and ultimately, your contribution enables excellence. Please, join me in celebrating the work of the Classical Theatre of Harlem.